Now, to commence proceedings. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carl Gombridge, Academic Lead and Director of Teaching and Learning at LIS London Interdisciplinary School in the UK. Before joining LIS, Carl was a Professorial Teaching Fellow of Interdisciplinary Education at UCL and is a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Carl has degrees in mathematics, physics and philosophy and was a professional opera singer before joining University College London in 2002. In 2010, he was appointed Program Director of the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences programs and led the design, development, launch and implementation of the degrees. Professor Carl Gombridge's presentation today is titled Interdisciplinarity, Virus, or network. Welcome, Carl. Thank you, Liana. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jan, for this invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak to you all here today. As Liana's mentioned, my day job revolves around interdisciplinarity in higher education. And so I was a little bit uh, intimidated when Liana kindly extended an invitation to me to talk to you about interdisciplinarity in art. Though I have worked specifically with several artists on projects I've um, run over the past 10 years or so. And so it was a great pleasure that I returned to them to inspire me for today's talk. So uh, somewhat unusually, I'm going to read uh, from the piece I've written for the publication around Jakob's work, which is coming out. But of course, I'm going to improvise and extemporize around um, the written text I've got in front of me. So the, the piece is entitled Interdisciplinarity, Virus or Network. The interdisciplinarian is always outside their comfort zone. There's always someone else who can give the more expert presentation, who has read more of the relevant literature, who knows what really counts in this area. But it goes deeper. To be committed to championing interdisciplinarity requires us to straddle two conflicting mentalities, embrace two contradictory emotional states. On the one hand, interdisciplinarity must be at least a little subversive. We might say at its best it is actually transgressive. It exists to challenge existing knowledge structures it wants to force us to look at our traditions of knowledge categorization, research funding processes, and educational infrastructures, and ask, is this the best we can do? Next slide, please. Why have we arrived here? And this is a book by the academic sociologists, Becker and Trowler, about uh, academic departments and the various ways of viewing knowledge categorization. So why have we arrived here? Have circumstances changed since the previous thinking was established that now require us to think afresh? What economic, gendered, racialized, politicized, path dependent, or simply inertial ways led us here to these particular silos, difficult jargons, and intellectual tribes and territories in Becker and Trowler's memorable phrase? Next slide, please. But on the other hand, we must have clarity. If we are committed to interdisciplinarity, to the extent that we want to communicate successfully about it and not just wave our arms around crying, we are transgressive, then we must have useful definitions, logical relations and semantic interconnections between our concepts that enable us to converse with doubters with traditionalists and more disciplinary academics and those outside academia or the intellectual world altogether who may have little interest in such things. Dare I say it, we must even aspire towards a state in which we have some kind of measure of interdisciplinarity, at least to the extent that we might say, this is good or interesting interdisciplinarity and this is poor and superficial. In this conflict between transgression and clarification that exists in the interdisciplinarian, we discern the difference between the virus and the network. 
I won't allow that these are just metaphors. <clears throat> George Lakoff, Lara Broditsky and others have taught us that metaphors can restructure a worldview entirely and contribute to creative historic insights. So metaphors, the virus and the network may be, but they capture and describe qualitatively different ways of understanding interdisciplinarity and different modus operandi for the interdisciplinarian. Artists are familiar with both these visions and both these metaphors. In the context of their own work and in their practice. And so on this slide you see a grainy image of some viruses and standard image really of a network with which we become so familiar and I'll return to that familiarity later. So the virus infects, we know only too well of course at the moment, it intrudes, it transgresses, it invades. In art, this changes our perception. Next slide, please. When the artist Peter Heuger exhibits in a disused ice rink among an excavated floor and below a modified ceiling, two peacocks, a working beehive and an incubator for cancer cells, our notion of the aesthetic is troubled. And a challenge is set for us to make unique connections between disturbingly juxtaposed objects. So we are in a sense invaded. Our consciousness, our aesthetic is invaded by such a confrontation. Next slide, please. In the many artists now interested in DNA, we see attempts to invade the code virus-like, to transgress technological, biological, and cultural boundaries and perturb our values and our priorities. Thus, Charlotte Jarvis, whose genetically modified biological liquid spray was used to coat apples in the foyer of The Hague, where the museum we're talking to today is, thus when Charlotte Jarvis creates sublime unease in the viewer, quote, reflecting our collective state of mind at the dawn of the biological age, end quote. That's a quote from William Myers' book on biological art. We see an example of this intersection between the artist and their desire to invade virus-like the DNA code. Slide six, please. Van der Beugel, too, in his beautiful ceramic pieces, invites us to consider, in a contradictory medium, many microbiological objects, cell cytoplasm, organelles, strands of DNA, RNA, ribosomes, amino acids, and others. Are these engineered in clear packets and regular matrices? as matter in gray and order M series demand to ask, and van der Beugel's very materials construction implies, or, next slide please, are they rather free flowing and protean as the mutation series seems to suggest, challenging its much more rigid ceramic substrate? Is the biological about to invade the inorganic? Or, conversely, will we capture and ossify life by technical and engineering means? Next slide, please. The multidisciplinary artist Alfonso Borragan, whose work incorporates photography, acoustics, medicine, agriculture, anthropology, apiology, that's the study of bees, and many other arts and sciences, both practical and theoretical, describes it well. Before I quote uh, Alfonso Baragan, just to explain, this is um, a set of stones found in human bodies, um, calcified objects, and Alfonso is very interested in this, as well as stones found in animals, 
And he's also interested in ingesting stones themselves and works with uh, several indigenous people on uh, the eating of stones. So Alfonso says, invoking both the artist herself as a virus and as an agent willing to be to suffer the effects of infection, he says, quote, it is a constant challenge for the artist to assimilate, end quote. The artist, quote, must allow herself to become infected, even if it is irrational, in order to catalyze change, end quote. And so I thought now, next slide, please, we'd watch the next video together in silence for about two and a half minutes, if we can. Is the video playing? Okay, thank you. I think we can stop the video there. Just hold the slide. Thank you. So this is, if you like, a, a graphic depiction of, the, uh, of an artist allowing themselves to be uh, invaded by a substance. In this case, it's a completely harms, harmless uh, chemical. Um, and we must actually think that the uh, viruses aren't always bad. Um, the most recent uh, scientific research seems to show that the human placenta in females is actually originally caused by a virus, and that's what's allowed the body, the human body in itself, to create um, a firewall, if you like, between the developing embryo and the human mother so that inf various infections can't pass uh, between the two. But nevertheless, this, this image of the artist Jan Marusic is his name, uh, allowing himself to be invaded by something and then expressing that through his very being, his very pause, I think is quite a nice illustration of what um, Alfonso was talking about, uh, about the artists allowing themselves to become affected uh, in order to catalyze change. So where the virus infects, disintegrates, and increases entropy and disorder, the network organizes, clarifies, makes transparent. 
So if you remember, we're looking at the contrast between these two ways of viewing interdisciplinarity, this invasive, destructive categorization of the virus, uh, classification description rather of the virus, and uh, something altogether much more about clarification and communication, that is the network. The beauty of a network is that it is perfectly describable as a mathematical object. There are simply nodes and edges which connect those nodes. From this simple definition, we can create an extraordinary variety of shapes and representations. Next slide, please. We have even derived a new science and a new art, network science and data visualization. Manuel Lima, as far back as 2011, created a beautiful book of such visualizations and the myriad networks and informational structures that underpin our world. I do recommend this book. It's one of my favorite. I often return to it when I want to be inspired about how to think about education, which I'll return to a bit later on. Next slide, please. This is my only slide with lots of text on, so I'm going to read some of this to you. It's a slide um, quoting a friend of mine, Don Foresta, who's a, a visionary, I think, art producer, and worked with many of the great video artists in Paris in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and Don was aware of the uh, rise of network thinking very early. So this is from his book, Many Worlds Connected, in 1986, in which there are 103 references to network I thought was quite striking, well before people were really talking about the internet. And he says, the evolving information technologies, the electronic creation and communication of sound, text, and image are merging to create a new space which is rapidly transforming our daily lives through the introduction of the network. Artistic presence in the network and the creativity it will bring to it will provoke new languages, new processes, new relationships. And I'll just let you read the last part, partly because it's slightly obscured on my screen, but it's very short. So Don, uh, I think, was absolutely correct in seeing in the power of the network in our modern society and in seeing the role, the importance that artists would have in representing that network, but also being represented on the network. And his work continues to try to have artists play more of a part in shaping the Internet. And that that's a tough battle. We wouldn't always say that's winning, but Don is very keen that uh, the Internet should be used for artistic purposes and not just commercial purposes. So, of course, m many, indeed most artists, can't help but be influenced by the rise of network thinking and have joined in and propelled this new interdisciplinary venture. Next slide, please. Heath Bunting's 2008 A Map of Terrorism displays in quasi-bureaucratic bureaucratic form hundreds of, of properties and capabilities and their interconnections of a potential terrorist. So on this slide, you can see such things as has contact with this financier or is a member of this religion or part of this other group and so on. And it's a relatively early example, I guess, of a, of a network diagram made for artistic purposes. Next slide, please. And Tor Thomas Saraceno's eerie and phantasmic networks and webs made from the silk of spiders, as well as non-organic materials, help us to see the extraordinary combinations of structure and disorder possible in this organized but protean form. So that's one of the beauties of the network, is that it is both highly organized, it's definable in simple mathematical terms, and yet it has this almost infinite topology you can shape it almost any way you like and create structures which barely resemble one another, but can, de can be defined mathematically. Next slide, please. It's another example of Saraceno's work, this time made out of inorganic material. No, nope, sorry, back one slide, please. Back one slide. Thank you. So recall, however, that for we interdisciplinarians, a particular value of the network 
is that it allows us to attempt some rational analysis of this tricky and abstract thing called interdisciplinarity. And that is the beauty of a mathematical definition. It's clarity and potential for rational extension. The nodes of the network can be imbued with clear meaning. It can be a transport hub, a neuron, a computer, a concept, a friend, and the connections between those nodes too. A road, a dendrite, a computer connection, a semantic link, or a Facebook connection. This allows us to attempt to map interdisciplinarity more precisely. What is connected to what, and by what means? If I study acoustics and anthropology, two very different knowledge domains, how can I connect them in a worthwhile interdisciplinary way? Next slide, please. Well, acoustics and anthropology, and indeed archaeology, are connected fascinatingly, as it turns out, by considering the different acoustic environments in which different peoples in different ages and different cultures live and how this influences their lives. So this is an example of an ancient site in Peru, um, excavated by a Western um, archaeologist and anthropologist, uh, in which they postulated the acoustic environment, particularly for rituals and religious ceremonies of the people. And I can give more details on the, on the names later if people are interested. So another example of um, considering interdisciplinarity as a network is what nodes and their connections might I require in order to measure the success of flood defenses against the impacts of climate change. So moving into a completely different space now, on purpose, interdisciplinarity can take us anywhere we like. So we move from acoustic anthropology and archaeology to considering the success of flood defenses against the impacts of climate change. Well, your nodes might be the knowledge areas of civil engineering, economics, politics, because no ma major engineering project can work without political backing, and a human science like anthropology in order to understand how local communities may use and maintain an engineering infrastructure. And your connections may be empirical, a case study, of how one infrastructure failed due to a lack of understanding of local customs, and the world is littered with such West, often westernly imposed engineering infrastructure projects which don't take account of the local circumstances. So that may be one way you're connecting your knowledge areas and trying to make sure that that sort of thing doesn't happen. Or it may be a conceptual link. What are the different disciplinary perspectives taken by, say, political science and anthropology when considering stakeholder engagement? in a large public project. Thus, knowledge itself becomes envisaged as an interdisciplinary network. Next slide, please. And I couldn't resist this uh, because this is a student of mine who's just won a major award for her, award for her work in November 3, uh, just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, her name is Lena Fuldauer. And she won this award because she takes such a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary perspective on this issue of climate change resilience of small island states. And it's a civil engineering PhD at Oxford University, but she combines anthropology, sociology, engineering, some economics, and even, I believe, some law in understanding the viability and long-term impact of these engineering projects. So that's her network of knowledge that she's created. It's greater than the sum of the parts. Next slide, please. I've gone a little bit fast, Liana, forgive me. It's partly the, the format uh, and partly um, the, the being online. So I'm going to just slow down a little bit, but we may finish a little bit early. In conclusion, I hope there are some questions and I'm very happy to discuss these ideas if we can uh, um, in any remaining time. In conclusion, we make the following observations. Much of our world is now obsessed with data. Analyzing data in order to understand our current and future predicaments 
is useful, but it will only take us so far. In Bayesian language, data analysis and the concomitant machine learning we see everywhere now will allow us to update our priors and so make better predictions. However, as Roger Martin, business academic and founder of the idea of integrative thinking states, relying on past data will often not give you the creative insights you need to remain truly agile and open to change. We might paraphrase this, if you really want new priors and not just be updating your old priors, you must look to art. You must allow for the sort of creativity that ignores or deliberately confounds past data. You must search to combine the previously uncombined, meld the previously unmelded. Here again, we see the metaphors of the virus and the network coming into play. Artists, quote from Manuel Lima's book, artists fear unsubtle reductionism, end quote. Barrow quoted in Lima, the book I mentioned about data visualization. And Barrow continues, for unsubtle reductionism destroys something about the human aspect of creativity. Final slide, please. I'll explain why we have this slide in a moment. However, we should not. Ah, I've got a note that my connection isn't good. Can you still hear me, Liana? Yes, I yes, can hear you okay. really well. Really well. Okay, thanks. Good. That was just Microsoft letting me. Um, so I'll explain what this little slide is. So these are ants working together, uh, and ants colonies have um, this emergent property that we think each ant is following a very simple instruction to do something uh, with the ant next to it or with a, a leaf or something. And yet when we look at the outside of the whole economy, the emergent a society, the ant society, I should say, the emergent properties of that ant society are immensely complex. So this is this idea I'm sure you're familiar with, that in, in many um, areas of, of life now, we see systems in which each individual part of the system is following a very simple rule relating to the thing often next to it. And yet when we zoom out, if you like, we see properties of the whole of that system which you can't see, which are literally unpredictable when you're in the system. So the famous one is the flock of birds and these beautiful shapes that one sees, which are only visible at a different scale. Inside the system, with the birds following the instructions, they wouldn't be able to see that emergent property. So we should not proceed in, in fear about reductionism, uh, killing anything about art. For we have new tools and new ways of thinking. The emergent properties of networks, and that's deeply appropriate, of course, to the title of this interesting symposium today. The emergent properties of these networks, such as I just mentioned, help us to understand that in many instances, the whole, what is generated, the output of the network, will always be greater than the sum of the parts. There are aspects of creativity and indeed the creative benefits of interdisciplinary working that look set to be theoretically, scientifically impossible to analyze away. Thank you, Liana. That's the end of my presentation. I almost feel I should go back and read the beginning more slowly again because I fear I, I rushed it a little bit. But um, I think that's probably not the form that we've never I've never seen that done before. So I probably shouldn't try that now. But so I'll stop there and then happy to discuss things or take any questions if there are any. Well, thank well, you thank so, you so much, much, Carl, Carl for um, that, that uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. presentation. And uh, we do, in fact, have some questions from the audience. Uh, firstly, um, uh, how can interdisciplinary approaches by the lenses of art and science help us to consider and perhaps solve some of the wicked problems facing humanity? 
<laughs> this, is, this is right up my street. So thank you who's fielded that one to me. Um, interestingly, I had to do a very short video, two minute video on this recently because my new, new university is trying to roll out some professional development for um, uh, corporates, frankly, um, uh, who are interested in kind of getting their people to think in more interesting and creative ways. And I'll give you an answer. I hope it's not too high level and abstract, but it, I guess I believe it's the most honest answer um, for, the, for the time being. And that is that you you have to invest in art because you can't predict what art is going to tell you about solving a problem. And it goes back to this issue of um, always looking at past data and looking for very linear, if you like, logical progression from what you knew in the past to what you might know in the future. And art, the best art, simply doesn't work in that way. You might have to invest quite a lot of time in what appears to be irrelevant, um, tangential, perhaps even frivolous sometimes, maybe playful. But unless you do that, you won't get the life-changing insights, the completely new defining moments or or, or visualizations or, or artistic uh, yeah, insights that, that, that art will give you. So I... I think it's really important to have art in the picture when discussing all these sorts of wicked problems, whether that's an artist working to visualize something or, or make it corporal in, in, in the way that Jacob and many others do, or whether it's someone um, visualizing the, the thinking that's going on in some kind of way. Um, there are so many ways artists can be involved, but that gain, that benefit is not often going to be linear, I think. So it's a kind of, you have to have it, otherwise you probably won't get the great insights you need, but you also have to take the risk that sometimes it's not gonna happen. The artist may not contribute, or it might take a long time, or the insight might be something very different from what you, what you expected. So I hope that helps some sort of answer. You need to have art in the space when discussing these problems, and you need to make the case for it if people aren't willing to pay for it or don't see the point. Um, and therefore, you need to have some kind of um, arguments to, to back up why you're doing this and support it, even if it doesn't always lead to the immediate kind of linear outcomes that might be expected in some other forms of problem solving. Great. And you actually mentioned uh, just then you were talking about data and the use of data. And so that leads to our second question. Um, how reliable is the data that experts use to analyse problems? Um, hmm. I, I feel, I feel um, a slight loadedness behind that question as if the person thinking is not very reliable. So there is no data that comes to us unbiased, of course. There's no data that isn't structured in relation to other data, which is a very interesting uh, idea. Um, so the answer is uh, very un that it, it, it isn't very reliable. Um, I do think that the internet has helped us in some contexts, a rather narrow context about what people do through the internet, see what people really do as opposed to what they say they do. <laughs> um, so we can get some sort of big data about people's shopping habits or real interests and so on from the internet that perhaps we couldn't get um, before from just talking to people. Um, but you're right in the sense of when we interact with the world and we, we take data, particularly if we're kind of doing uh, ethnography or any kind of human recording of perception, there's always going to be a tremendous amount of bias um, in there. So I'm not aware of artists directly exploring that, which might be interesting. So maybe someone in the audience could tell me about that. Um, but certainly you're right that this sort of obsession with data kind of almost at this level is sort of ignoring how we even got to that level with, with the data. And we need to be very, very, very cautious that what we're looking at in terms of data is reliable and unbiased and, and real in some way. I mean, look at the polling in politics. It's just so wrong every time. And that's where I think the Internet perhaps could uh, could tell us more. Of, of course, there are privacy issues around around collecting that sort of data as well. It's a great, interesting question and absolutely pivotal for today because we're obsessed with data. And yet we don't really think deeply enough about these issues of, of uh, the problematics of data, if you like. And uh, the third and final question, uh, can the ordinary person still expect science and technology to always come up with the solutions? 
Um, no. <laughs> um, science and technology are, well, this is a long, long conversation, of course. Uh, I'm not someone who thinks they're all, to certainly science, I don't think is all totally constructed, although that's, I'm slightly against the countercurrent that thinks that all knowledge, often people think all knowledge is socially constructed, although that particular discussion breaks down a little bit in universities where the scientists often or don't think it's all totally constructed. And as you move through the social sciences to the humanities, you get more and more constructivist views of knowledge. I'm, I'm a little bit more towards the science um, there, but technology as an application of science seems to me to be almost entirely human human concern and driven by humans values and their needs and wants and desires and so on so those are the things that we need to work out what we want to do um if we're going to live in the ways that we want and looking at things like the planetary crisis um the solutions frustrate me really because i don't think they're anywhere even on the same universe as what needs to be done we need to change people's values around consumption shopping traveling much, much, much harder to do than stopping waste. Stopping waste is not going to stop the climate crisis. Changing human nature would, but that's not a scientific or technological problem. So <laughs> there's a very stark example of something I think which is extremely difficult to do, but doesn't have much on the surface, at least, to, to do with science. Now, it'd be nice to think the science might come up with some insights about human behavior and our own brains, which when we're confronted with might help us change, but it's it's those things we need to change. Um, and science won't directly help us do that. Fantastic. Well, that's wonderful, Carl. Thank you so much for your in very uh, thought provoking and inspiring presentation. And uh, we'd like to thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, Leanne. Of course, it will be available in the publication, won't it? Where yes. if I didn't go too fast, you can reread and uh, Get in touch with me. Thank you, yes, Leanne. Yes.